Okay, we're back at 91.7 KOOP right here in Austin, Texas. This is Bringing Light into Darkness, and bringing the light tonight is our guest, Patrick Lawrence, author, investigative journalist. And let me ask you to, to comment, because I think when you want to get to the heart of a matter and you want to get to real justice, you want to then follow up with people that have inside information. And Mueller has quoted Julian Assange in some of the report there, but it's, it's fascinating to me that despite multiple efforts by Assange, in fact, one that was well on its way to fruition to testify through verifiable sources and such, one of them was shot down by James Comey, who personally intervened to order a stand down. In you Scott- mean the negotiation, Justice Department negotiation to get to give Assange some kind of limited uh, immunity? To or, or, well, actually, there was a couple of different opportunities. The, the limited immunity might have been part of the deal, but I mean, I think Assange was clearly ready to talk at almost any cost just to get the other side of the story out. And he also yes. made public offers to testify to Congress, not just to Mueller. And these and, and there's ways to have done that without, uh, you know, releasing him or, you know, whatever the concern was at that level. I think you've also mentioned, and I want you to highlight this as well, that not just William Benny, the technical director of the NSA with great insights, but uh, Edward Loomis, another great technical NSA you know, individual as well. And then uh, people like, like you mentioned, and Ray McGovern, some of the other veterans for intelligence professionals, but also like Craig Murray, who had inside connections, perhaps, to some of the, the principal exactly. issues. Why can wasn't you, Craig Murray interviewed? Right? Yeah. Can you, please, can you please elaborate on that? Because I think we don't have the facts, but we're not stupid. And, you know, these are kind of assumptions and, and deductive reasoning things that we, we cannot abandon. Yeah. And, and, and hopefully yeah. they will be addressed. But can you just run us through the things that you think are most important in that regard? Uh, well, uh, I would I would dispute very mildly your remark that we don't have facts. We do have mm-hmm. the facts, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the the challenge now is to surface these facts and prosecute the case such that they are accepted. I don't think it's impossible, but I think it's going to be very difficult. Mm-hmm. And it, and as I've often said in a in moments of nothing like despair, but something approaching it. We may have to wait for the historians, right? When I said, when I wrote it a year ago, too big to fail, what I meant was the investment made in the Rube Goldberg narrative by the following institutions, Democratic Party, DNC, CIA, FBI, a section of the Justice Department, and quite extravagantly, the media, New York Times in the front. The investment they have made in this story is quite astonishing. And if the story fails, imagine the damage it will do to these institutions. These are some of the very most basic institutions of our republic. What's going to happen? It would shake this country to the foundation stones, uh, Pedro, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I think that's a, a, one of the big impediments now. In a certain way, the realities of this case cannot come out because, I mean, these people have, for the sake of Hillary Clinton's campaign and to spare the DNC the embarrassment of screwing Bernie Sanders, we've got a situation here that's threatening the stability of this country and bringing U.S.-Russian relations to a wildly unnecessary point of dangerous animosity, right? This is pretty outsized cost it, when placed next to the malfeasance we're, we're talking about, right? I think I fear I've lost track of your original question, so pose it again and I'll go for it. Yeah, no, no, and I, that, that's fine. I think where you actually are heading is more important. And I think in that article that you did, you mentioned the Too Big to Fail article back in August 13th, 2018. I think the demonization of Russia. When I say the demonization, I'm saying I, I, I use the word demonization because when you create claims against another country, 
that are at the level of the claims that we have made and do not bring that evidence. I, I, what I was suggesting is that there's not, not that there wasn't evidence of what, what is up and what is down. I was talking about the Mueller's report does not provide the evidence to support that deal, by the way. But also, in your piece, you also talked very appropriately about the alleged attempt to murder Sergi and Julius Skirpel. Another incident in which the evidence of the severity of this crime was not made public at all, and there was an immediate jump to judgment before there was even an investigation, and we were even kicking out hundreds of diplomats throughout the Western world. So this is not just about the DNC. This is a a polarization. This is a foreign policy, almost like a hegemony type of thing in which Russia is seen as this bad actor that challenges us in other parts of the world, so therefore we have to create this monster to, uh, right. you know, type of thing. But, you know, if you can speak to that issue, if you can speak to this, just the, you mentioned it throughout your piece in Too Big to Fail, that Russia's routinely advanced as the greatest threat to democracy Americans now face. Right, right. The Screepall case was just shabby beyond even our shabby standards. Uh, Theresa May behaved so I had to say to myself afterwards, God, MI6 has lost its fastball. This stuff is so ridiculous. Prime Minister May was speaking in Parliament within hours, absolutely concluding that the Russians were culpable. And Boris Johnson, Um, God save us. (laughs) Concluding uh, that the Russians were culpable Mm -hmm. before the investigation even started. Right. Why have, I mean... You would have thought they are smart enough to say, okay, well, now we're going to frame the Russians, but we've got to wait for some credibility here. We'll wait for the investigation. And now get going on that investigation. They didn't even wait that long, right? Mm-hmm. We haven't seen the Skripals in many months. The reports I heard last time, haven't paid attention in a while, is that the daughter, Yulia, wants to go back to Russia, those people who were trying to murder her. Right, right, right. Uh, allegedly, um, right. About demonization, I I think, you know, a very fine book can be written about the West's relations with Russia, and and it would go back to the 1830s in uh, Tocqueville and uh, uh, Michelet and and others, right, presciently pointing out that the two great powers in the world, then emerging, the United States and, and Tsarist Russia, would eventually come to a point of confrontation, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of in the water we drink, but it's not, a, your, your listeners need to know, it goes way, way back in history, okay? It's something that this sort of animosity can be invoked quite easily because it runs so deep, okay? I think we have to go a little further afield here to answer your question, not far. Trump presented a very, very major threat to the Washington orthodoxy when he began campaigning one of his planks being, uh, we need a better relationship with Russia. That's a direct challenge to the Pentagon, NATO, the defense industries, and once again, the intelligence people. Mm -hmm. They are all very dependent on a bad relationship with Russia, and Russians cast as an evil people, you know, we, we must guard against. As we speak, we're running commando drills in the Baltics with American soldiers. It just was in the paper last week. I thought to myself, what if they were running commando drills in Baja, California, or, you know, or Mexico or someplace, like, or British mm-hmm. Columbia? Can you imagine? That's what we're doing. And this, what you call demonization, this animosity, the adversarial relationship is absolutely precious to the well-being of the defense establishment, intelligence, NATO, right? Trump had the temerity to question the usefulness of NATO. It was a very good question. Yeah. And I think this is what it's all about. And coming back to Russiagate, this is just dreadfully magnified what is a manufactured problem in the first place. And my friend Stephen Cohen suggests that it's probably a generation before we can repair the damage in the bilateral relationship that it has sustained over the last several years. And that's a pity. Among many other things, Pedro, we're looking at a very, very great deal of lost opportunity. And it's cost a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. Exhibit A is Syria. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, we're just about out of time. And what I wanted to share with our audience is that I have really enjoyed your writings from from a historical and a current politic. Uh, Very so kind of you, Pedro. Well, Thank well, you. It's, it's, it's well deserved. It's well researched. It's well thought out. And I wanted to just share with folks that we've been visiting with Patrick Lawrence. He writes foreign affairs commentary for a variety of publications. Um, he has a website in which you can find all of his publications at patricklawrence.us. I think today, more than ever, stepping outside the traditional information channels is the only way to get at the other dissenting point of view. And if you don't have a dissenting point of view, then obviously we're much more vulnerable to losing what's precious around us. If I could just share one other thing, your website is at patricklawrence.us. You have mm-hmm. a Twitter account too. What is what is the? Uh... Yeah, it's the at sign, uh-huh. and then the flautist. T H E F L O U T I S T. The flautist. Okay, and listen, I would. Uh, I, I welcome my followers, and I try to keep up with them by way of replies and all that sort of thing. Right? Yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you so much for making yourself available tonight. We'll continue to follow your work, and we hope that uh, we can have you back on in the future. And thank what a great pleasure, Pedro. Thank you for your generous welcome. All right. You're very, very welcome. All right. So thank you so much, Patrick Lawrence. We have to wrap things up.